Yes, um, well, hello, good morning, everyone. Um, as Jamie said, my name is Chris Cairns. I am a trademark attorney at, at Murgatroyd, um, and I will sort of try and chair today's seminars. Um, so you know, there will be a question and answer session, but we'll hold that to, to the very, very end. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speakers, Drew and Joanne. Um, Drew and Joanne are our trademark directors at Murgatroyd, each with nearly 20 years experience. They are both, this is a bit of a mouthful, um, UK chartered trademark and design attorneys, European trademark and design attorneys, and Irish and trademark design attorneys, which is very impressive. Um, both have extensive experience in advising a wide range of clients on, on trademark matters, not only in Europe, but throughout the rest of the world. Um, without further ado, I would first like to introduce our speaker, uh, is going to be Drew, who, who will now shed some light on, on Brexit. So, over to Drew. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, introduction, Chris. Um, can everybody hear me okay with the mic? Is that all going good? Okay, great. Well, uh, I've been introduced as Drew, and that's just for reasons of brevity. We've already had an explanation of the Murgatroyd name, so I won't uh, go into the etymology of my name. So, uh, yeah, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, Brexit and uh, how you can defend your portfolio from that and plan for the future, make sure that you are Brexit-proof. Now, what we've done today is we've divided our talk into two parts. So I'm going to talk about what's called the uh, pre-Brexit landscape, uh, which is leading up to a certain point in the negotiations. And then my colleague, Joanne Leckie, is going to talk about the post-Brexit period and how you can protect your mark during all of these phases. So I've started off with a definition, uh, which is starting at a very low base, but we're going to work it up from there, and it's going to get pretty steep at some point. So we'll start off easy. Um, so Brexit is defined as the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the European Union, which is, of course, a very straightforward and obvious definition. However, there is a point in there to bear in mind, which is that Brexit actually hasn't happened yet. Uh, so despite all the fuss and the headlines, we always need to be mindful that the actual exit of the UK from the European Union is yet to happen. So the question then, of course, is, well, you know, what's the fuss? So what has actually happened? So all of this started with the Brexit referendum in June 2016, where a majority of the British public voted for the UK to leave the European Union. Uh, it was a bit of a shock uh, result, uh, one of several to follow across the world. And uh, yeah, it resulted in the resignation of David Cameron and uh, a bit of a leadership challenge uh, and a lot of procrastination as to what they do next. Um, my understanding is that the referendum result was not in fact actually binding on the government, but having had the referendum, there wasn't much choice other than to just proceed with it. So what they had to do next was to trigger Article 50, which would be the formal notice uh, for the UK to leave uh, the European Union. Uh, and that uh, was put off for as long as possible. <laughs> but uh, on the 29th of March 2017, uh, Theresa May sent a letter to President Donald Tusk, formally giving notice that the uh, UK will be leaving. So that was the big step that needed to be taken. And that triggered a two-year period uh, for negotiation about how the separation is going to take place. So that period uh, is currently only two years, um, but during that period there was uh, some further negotiations that there would be a transitional period just uh, under two years that would follow from that. So ever since then and since the referendum results, uh, you've probably all seen a lot of newsletters and uh, emails and talks about Brexit and all this sort of thing. But the reality is that until March 2019, we actually didn't know terribly much about what was going to happen uh, because all of it was really just speculation of varying degrees. But on the, 20, on the 19th of March, uh, a draft agreement was published uh, in which the European Commission set out in great detail uh, how they want the separation to take place. And there are five uh, generous pages that deal with intellectual property. Uh, and uh, that's given us some degree of clarity as to how things might unfold. The UK government, for their part, has taken a literally a green highlighter to the document, indicating the parts that they uh, agree with in principle. And that, too, has given us some comfort uh, because uh, it looks as if rights should be preserved. And Joanne will be talking more about that. But the key. Uh, phases to bear in mind at this stage are how it will unfold and uh, 
what, what stepping stones there will be to full and complete Brexit. So there's the pre-Brexit phase, which I'm talking about. Then there's the transitional period, which follows the two years at the end of that Article 50 notice, in which various things will apply and various things won't apply. And then there's the post-transitional period, uh, in which the UK will be completely separated from the European Union and just normal national law will apply. So the big question is, well, when is Brexit Day? When, when is the key date to bear in mind? So on the 29th of March 2019 at uh, 0, 0100 hours Brussels time, or more specifically for the UK, 11 p.m., uh, that will be the start of Brexit. Now, as I said, that's not absolute and complete Brexit. That'll actually be the end of the Article 50 negotiation period and the beginning of the transitional period. So certain things will apply and certain things won't apply. The uh, draft withdrawal agreement sets that all out in great detail in about 60 pages or so. Um, we're just here to talk about the IP aspects, but to give you a broader idea, for example, the UK can st will then be able to start negotiating trade deals with other countries, but it won't be able to actually s close those deals until they're outside of the transitional period. The UK will still be bound by EU law, but they won't have a say in actually making that law. So there'll be various in and out sort of transitional provisions during that stage. So that will last until the 31st of December 2020. We'll be working through this transitional period during which there'll be some fairly exotic things happening on the IP front. And Joanne will be detailing some of those. Uh, once uh, 2021 starts, then that is the absolute separation of the UK from the European Union. So as I said, uh, the UK is still a member of the EU. So the bottom line at the moment is that more or less it is still business as usual. Everything you know or may not know about the European Union trademark system still applies. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go over a few of these, uh, these points um, just by way of refresher, but also some of you may not be more familiar with these because these are still opportunities that you can take advantage of in the current time. So at the moment, as I said earlier, all EU law is still fully applicable in the UK. Uh, the European Union trademark registration still covers the UK. There's been no loss of rights at this stage. If you file a European Union trademark application right now, it will still cover the UK, so you don't have to worry about delaying that or that you'll be losing out on any basis. Um, the validity of a European Union trademark registration can be maintained by usage in just one country, uh, which is a great feature of the European Union trademark system, but once the transitional period starts, that will be undermined and at risk. So there'll be various things to bear in mind during that period, uh, which Joanne will detail, I think a basic principle is, which we all already know, you know, if you don't use your trademarks, you lose them. So some of these first principles uh, guidance points can keep you safe during the Brexit process. If you are in a position to use your trademark, it might be a good idea to start doing that. So um, European Union trademark registrations can still form the basis for pan-European injunctions. And at the moment, the UK courts can still uh, serve uh, the purpose for obtaining those injunctions. It's a very useful, useful uh, option for uh, stopping counterfeit goods and so on. Uh, and currently, um, UK registrations can still block a later European Union trademark application. So if you have a watch service and you see that there's an EU TM that you want to stop, and the only ammunition you have is a UK application or registration, that's still good to go. You can still use that. Uh, the UK can still currently refer questions of interpretation of EU law to the Court of Justice of the European Union, so we still have that option. Uh, you know, love it or hate it, but we can still get their opinion <laughs> on questions of law. And Paris Convention priority still continues to function as normal. We don't really foresee any, any change to that because the Paris Convention is a completely separate arrangement. So that should just be the same throughout the process. So uh, another obvious point, European Union trademarks cover 28 countries of the European Union, currently still cover the UK. It has always been the case that uh, when we advise our foreign clients on EU TMs, we point out that countries that you might assume are in the EU are in fact not in the EU. So for example, Norway and Switzerland have never been in the EU. So you've always, if you wanted to have uh, continental protection, had to designate them separately. And of course, post Brexit, you will also have to designate the UK separately. EUTM still remain popular despite the referendum results, uh, and we still get plenty of instructions to file them. Uh, they a very cost-effective way of protecting your rights. The main hubs for instructing those are the UK and Germany, so we're still in a good position to uh, service those requests at the moment, and will be in the future, because as Jamie said, we have offices in Germany and other places. And of course, you can still designate European Union trademarks via the Madrid system. Uh, we don't envision that changing. 
and those would still at the moment cover the UK. So you don't need to have any anxiety about using the Madrid system to uh, designate EUTMs. UK applications or registrations can still form the basis for uh, Madrid registrations, well, no surprise there, and that won't change, uh, and you can still currently designate the EU, and we don't expect to change there. So the key thing we had to talk about today is Brexit proofing. So how do you, how do you position yourself uh, during these various phases to ensure that you're going to be safe? Now, I think, you know, the, we have to point out the fact that there are no obviously clear and simple answers. There's no one size fits all. Uh, and that's due to a number of reasons. I mean, all clients are different. Uh, you have different budgets, different approaches to risk, different priorities. But even leaving that aside, there are a few uh, crucial factors here, which is one, although the draft agreement gives us a lot of guidance as to how things may pan out, the draft agreement could be changed, could be completely different, or the draft agreement might not be reached at all, which would be a very distressing situation. And that might be due to, or most likely will be due to, things that have nothing to do with IP. So things like the Irish border, rights of uh, EU immigrants and so on. So you have to bear in mind there are a lot of moving parts, lots of things changing all the time. So what can you do? Well, what we're advising as a general principle is if you're filing a new, tr new trademark in the European Union that you've never filed ever before, so it's completely brand new, we'd say at this stage it's probably prudent to file both an EU trademark and a UK trademark. So you just start off filing in both if it's your first filing. Uh, we think that makes sense uh, and that would be a prudent step with anything that's new. What about if you already have a European Union trademark registration? Uh, should you have an additional UK? You know, is that something worth doing? Now, that also depends. Uh, a lot of British firms are already pushing that idea, uh, you know, because it's pretty good for business. Uh, but there are some merits to it. Uh, and certainly, if you have a uh, core mark or a house mark uh, that's extremely important, you might want to double up for those. Or, you know, if you're very risk averse, that's, that's the way to go. But just bear in mind, of course, the obvious point that unless you're within the six-month priority period, the UK application that you file is not going to be like for like. So it'll have a later filing date. So it still gives you some protection, and there'd be some specific scenarios where you'd want to do that. But uh, you, it's not going to be a complete like for like protection. The draft agreement gives some very good comfort on this point, which Joanne will go into. Uh, may mean that you don't have to worry quite so much about doubling up. But as I said, the draft agreement might not be reached. If your only area of usage is the UK, uh, or perhaps your only area of usage is somewhere in the EU outside of the UK, it may be prudent to actually have a separate UK uh, application in place and a registration. Um, that'll help you with non-use issues, both uh, in the transitional period and in the future. If you've got a freshly minted registration, you know, you've got that five-year period that gives you some comfort. Again, the agreement has some very special exotic provisions relating to that, but if you've got worries about usage, whether your mark's being used or not, it's something certainly to consider having a separate UK. Now, I don't know if many of you will be familiar with the seniority process uh, that relates to European Union trademark registrations. It's uh, unique to the European system, so it's not something that really exists outside of the EU. It enables you to basically backdate a European uh, registration to whatever national right you have. Now, the idea of this was to allow you to lapse uh, your various national registrations. Now, if you have uh, a UK registration currently that's due for renewal, and this forms the basis of a seniority claim, whereas in the past you might have taken the view, well, let's lapse that because you've got the seniority claim in place and you can just rely on your EUTM, we're thinking given the uncertainty, it's probably better to just renew those registrations at this stage rather than let them go because uh, it just gives you that extra plank of, of safety in that scenario. Uh, another very... Uh, general point would be review your agreements. Uh, a lot of agreements would specify the European Union as a territory, um, so you know, that territory is going to change. Y you, know, you may be lucky in a given scenario, the intentions of the parties might be very clear that they intended to cover the UK, because that's how the European Union was formed at that particular stage. Um, but you could also have an agreement where the uh, issue of trade inside and outside the European Union, or more specifically the European Economic Area, was fundamental to the contract. And now that the UK is no longer in there, that contract may no longer make sense, uh, could expose clients to all sorts of risks. Uh, so you might want to look at those agreements and, if possible, renegotiate them or amend them. So as I said, the, uh, those are a few pointers. Uh, and again, the draft agreement will give you uh, some comfort that almost encourages a slightly more hands-off approach. But again, that might not be reached. It could be amended uh, and things could change. So, I think when you boil all of this advice down, 
uh, actually the, the main point to remember what I'd recommend is redundancy. Uh, you know, if you've got both, if you've got a UK and an EUTM, uh, more or less you can, you can forget about the issue, you've, you've, you've got double cover and the only real downside there is cost. So if you're thinking, well, let's, you know, I don't want to be thinking about this for the next year or so, let, let's just do both. Uh, I mean, you won't necessarily get, you know, your filing dates uh, the same as the European Union, but, you know, do the UK as well. You know, that should uh, protect yourself from most risks. Now, the other issue is that UK trademark practitioners, as things stand, uh, it seems more likely than not that they will not have representation rights before the EU IPO because there's a requirements of nationality uh, of a European Union country, and of course the UK will no longer be a European Union country. Um, so some of our clients have come to us and said, well, look, we know you guys are across Europe, so you know, we've not got any risk of our attorneys not being able to act and so on. And as Jamie said, I mean, Murgatroyd is way ahead of the curve of this. I mean, we we're opening offices you know, more than 10 years ago across Europe, and uh, we're very well positioned to look after you in that respect. And uh, yeah, unlike our competitors, we didn't open them after the referendum result. You know, they're not post boxes. We've got very, very good people there with a uh, great uh, depth and breadth of experience. So certainly um, in terms of representation, if you use Murgatroyd, you will be Brexit proof. And on that note, I will pass you over to my colleague, Joanne Leckie, who's gonna to talk to you about the post Brexit landscape. Thank you very much. So in some ways I've got the the poison chalice half of the presentation because nothing is certain about the post-Brexit landscape. Um, I think to recap on the key dates, um, the UK is going to leave the EU in 2019 and there is a transitional period which has been agreed after that of just under two years, during which it's envisaged that the intellectual property framework will remain substantively the same. Having said that, Brexit is an unprecedented situation. So while there have been member states join the EU since it was formed, there's never been a situation where a member state has decided to leave. And there has been a great deal of anxiety and uncertainty surrounding many aspects of which um, IP is just one. The dry bit, which is the agreed uh, draft withdrawal agreement which was published by the European Commission just a couple of months ago has provided I think some certainty and real progress towards what is likely to happen um, your IP rights after Brexit um, so I think it's important to cover just part of that article 50 um, because it states that these are the points that have been agreed in principle and they're only likely to be subject to some minor technical revisions in the coming weeks and months, <clears throat> but hopefully nothing substantive. So it says that the holder of any of the following intellectual property rights, um, which have been registered or granted before the end of the transitional period, shall, crucially without any re-examination, become the holder of a comparable registered and enforceable IP right in the UK. So that means essentially the same trademark, the same goods and services, and it essentially converted into a UK national right. So as I said, this paper kind of highlights the points in the European Commission's draft withdrawal agreement that have been agreed by the negotiators. And the intention is to create an equivalent cloned right in the UK. The same filing date, the same priority date, and the same seniority dates of the UK of the EU registration, and with no re-examination. As Drew said, the agreement hasn't been finalised, and some further changes could occur, but I think it is very reassuring, and it is also in the interest of the UK government to encourage UK rights holders um, to, to remain in the UK and to have those rights, to make it as easy as possible to maintain your rights. So what does it mean for European trademarks? Well, there is a difference between those marks that will be registered at the end of the transitional period and those that are still pending. And so European trademarks, I'll use that interchangeably with um, European designations of Madrid because they're effectively the same. So those that are registered at the end of the transitional period will automatically give rise to identical registered rights in the UK. 
However, critically, there is no current agreement that trademark applications that are still pending at the end of the transitional period will automatically give rise to the same rights. And after the transitional period, anything that's still pending will only result in registered rights covering the remaining 27 countries, but not the UK. And if you've had experience with the European trademark system, you know that the examination can be lengthy. There's a relatively long uh, publication period and there are a high number of oppositions, um, primarily because it can be based on an earlier right in any one of the member states. So as Drew said, for any newly filed application, some clients are opting for a belt and braces approach and filing a UK national application in conjunction with their European application. It has been agreed that following the transitional period, owners of applications that are still pending will have a further nine months to file corresponding applications that claim priority or seniority from their EU applications. But what's unclear about that is what the process is going to involve. So the administrative details, the cost, the burden on the UK national office, um, because some European trademark applications, well, you're not obliged to designate English, for example, as one of your languages. Um, so, I mean, it raises all kinds of issues of translation, uncertainty then surrounding the scope of the specification and so on. There are some additional considerations um, involved and, and one of those is intent to use. Um, UK national applications require a bona fide intent to use and that's a declaration that you make on filing your trademark application. Uh, by contrast, European trademark applications don't have the same requirement. And critically, the intent to use can form a basis for opposing or invalidating your UK national right. And there has been some concern raised that entering European trademark applications that have not had the intent to use could somehow undermine the state of the UK register. This has been a point that's been quite heavily debated by our professional body. Um, because it's obviously the balance is not the same for the cloned application as it would be for a UK national right. And the potential scenarios that have been mooted are that all newly created UK clones should have a rebuttable presumption of intent to use, or that the former system for opting in to entry on the UK national register of one of the clones should include a declaration of actual use or intent to use. You could, of course, request use on renewal, although we don't currently do that, and I know certain countries do do that. Um, but that's just a point that's still to be decided. Um, the other is seniority, which Drew touched on, um, and the concept, which has been really useful, particularly for holders of large IP portfolios, um, because it, it, it has this option of backdating your rights in a national member state and allowing your earlier uh, national registration to lapse. So if you have an extremely large portfolio, it can save on renewal fees and give you the benefit of those earlier rights. Sometimes they actually predate the European system. But there is a large number of existing European trademark registrations that have UK seniority claims where the earlier UK registration has actually been allowed to lapse because obviously Brexit well, we didn't foresee that Brexit would happen before the referendum. So without specific provision for these, um, these earlier rights could be lost. SIPMA, who I referred to earlier, has proposed that all lapsed UK trademark registrations for which there is a valid seniority claim should be revived with no backdated renewal fees. Um, and that's one option, although again, the validity of seniority has never actually been tested in court. Um, I suppose that could result in some duplication on the register where you'd have a revived UK registration along with your cloned UK, but that's something that you could um, visit at the time of renewal um, or possibly you know, as part of your regular portfolio reviews. Um, interestingly, and without going into too much uh, technical detail, um, we did have clarification from the UK IPO about European trademarks that have been converted. Conversion is a process where if your European registration is invalidated, but not invalidated on every member state, then you can convert it into national registrations in other member states. 
Um, and in those instances, the seniority claim has been preserved. So I think that's, um, that's quite encouraging that you know, the similar situation is likely to arise. I think ultimately the UK IPO, the UK government are likely to go for the most straightforward approach. They want to make it easy for, UK, for any business to retain their UK rights and it's not in anyone's interest to have loss of rights. So the other consideration is what happens for proceedings that are still ongoing at the end of the transitional period. It's fairly straightforward in that if there are invalidity or revocation proceedings in Europe from a process that was still ongoing at the end of the transitional period, the corresponding UK right will also be invalidated or revoked from the same date. Where it's less clear is when it comes to proof of use. It's not addressed in great detail in the draft withdrawal agreement, but it has said that um, a UK right that corresponds to a UK registered trademark, i.e. one of your UK clones, will not be revoked for non-use if it has not been genuinely used in the UK before the end of the transitional period, as long as it was used elsewhere in the EU. And again, I think that's quite important uh, for rights holders because it means that if you haven't actively used your right in the UK, when it is cloned, it will not automatically become vulnerable to revocation for non-use. UK trademarks are likely to have an additional period of time to be genuinely used in the UK before they become vulnerable to revocation, but that has not yet been agreed how long this additional period will be and what the burden is likely to be. So again, as Drew said, if you are in a position to use your trademark in the UK beyond token use, then um, it's probably a good idea to do so. Um, a cloned UK trademark will be able to claim a reputation conversely acquired through use of the corresponding EU trademark in the remaining member states, provided that such use occurred before the end of the transitional period. But after the transitional period, clearly acquired reputation will need to be established through use in the UK alone. Interestingly, I mean, I suppose the middle point is fairly obvious that after the end, once, we're, once we've finally departed, use in the UK will not support the European registration and vice versa. However, the non-use period in the UK is three years and proof of use can be in the last five years. So, in fact, use in the UK could support your European registration while it was part of the EU. So even post-Brexit, if you have use in the UK that you know, dated back, say, four or five years, you can still present that, but obviously the relevance of the use will decrease over time. So what are the risks and what, what are the actions required? Well, as you said, there is no right answer, which is kind of good and bad. All businesses are different. Um, they have different needs and different priorities. It's worth conducting regular portfolio reviews because some clients will already have sufficient protection in place. Some clients already have UK registrations in parallel with their, UK, with their EU rights. We're not recommending that seniority claims are even filed at the moment um, because they can be filed at any time. But we are recommending that you don't let your existing UK rights lapse in favour of EU rights. Renewal fees in the UK are only payable once every 10 years and they are low. Consider filing UK trademark applications for existing brands, in particular where key brands um, where the UK is an important market. And as Dre said, review your existing agreements, review your, your licences to make sure that they will remain in force after the withdrawal date. Another point is just in terms of your domain name, consider registering other top level domains. But the best strategy, I think, in conclusion for your client's businesses is to kind of balance, with any, as with any filing strategy, your available resources and your, your wider business strategy in the UK market. So. Yeah. Thank you to Joanne and to Drew. Um, that was very interesting and very informative. Um, I think we will now open up the, the questions and answers session. So does anyone have any questions? discussed, um, expand on some of those points. So I don't know, Joe, I mean, we're discussing the seniority point mm -hmm. about how that might be processed uh, in the future. So something we actually looked at only last week, um, and we corresponded with the uh, UK IPO, was we became aware and the fact that actually seniority claims can theoretically at least 
be recorded against UK registrations, which is a very unusual mm -hmm. thing because they actually apply only to European Union trademarks. But how that can happen, and we couldn't determine from the registry whether it has in fact happened, but the way it could happen is if you have an EU registration which is then invalidated for some reason, let's say for example an earlier German right comes to light, you've always had, ever since the beginning of the EU system, the opportunity to convert that failed European registration into one or more European national applications in everywhere apart from where the problem lies. So you wouldn't be able to convert to Germany because that's where you got knocked out. But let's say there was no problem in the UK. So you could convert that European Union trademark to a UK application. Now you've always been able to do that. We've all handled conversions of that kind. Now if it also happened that that European Union trademark registration happened to have a seniority claim and that that seniority claim related to that particular country that you were converting into, then that seniority claim would be recorded on the UK register. So what that basically means is the infrastructure is, is already there for yeah. these cloned registrations to actually go onto the UK register and have the seniority date recorded. Uh, so it seems like the channels are very smooth for that and the seniority should be well processed, hopefully, uh, you know, post-Brexit uh, during the transitional period. We asked the registry for an example of one of these because it's not a kind of thing you can search for and they confirmed that they too cannot search for them. So we don't know if that's actually ever happened, but they confirmed that it was theoretically possible. <laughs> okay, thanks for that, Drew. Um, is there no other questions then? Yes? I gathered that... Did you hear the first part? Uh, enact a whole number of new yeah. regulations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is, is been anything done in that regard? Because I imagine that uh, it's not really on the UK's side to decide how mm. it's going to uh, yeah. handle it. It's the end of the, I, th of the I mean, here. I think, you know, I'm not sure when the Brexit referendum was held that anyone could have envisaged the sheer volume of issues that would arise. Um, from the divorce. I think, you know, ultimately um, there are so many issues on the agenda that IP is one of them and it is an important one. But as Drew said, you know, there are other many, yeah. many other important issues. So I, I think, and, and again, it's, it's kind of, my part is a bit of a poison chalice because nothing is certain, but we think it is probably most likely that they will make it as easy as possible so they will, they're likely to have to enact some kind of national law to cover the scenarios that, that I outlined. But um, I think it's more likely than not yeah. that they will make it a rubber stamping issue. Yeah. Uh, there will be, there, there are always going to be unprecedented situations that will arise. Um, but I think it's, yeah. it's more likely than well, not I think, to um, be straightforward. And this is, you know, we're not, uh, these are all different areas of law, but just based on the news reports we've seen. I think there's something, a, a Great Repeal Act, which uh, I think both repeals the uh, authority of the European Union, but also uh, makes pretty much everything that hasn't been discussed still carry on as normal until it's changed. So they're essentially saying, okay, well, for anything that isn't in the draft agreement where you know, they're going to chapter and verse, the default position is things stay the same, and then the UK may or may not change that going mm. forward. Um, so th I think there is some separate legislation. I think it's still being discussed. Yeah. Uh, just to sort of, well, they're not going to throw all the laws out the window. Uh, very, very broadly speaking, it'll be the case like everything is roughly the same except if it's been changed. So the part we know about is IP, and that's where they've uh, highlighted the things they agree on. Yeah. Uh, but for the other things, uh, it'll, it'll depend on them issue by issue. Thank you very much for the uh, informative presentation. Uh, I have just question about the on the aspect of the enforcement of uh, EU trademark registration uh, covering the UK because that's uh, still effective to uh, pursue the uh, damages in the past infringement uh, until the expiration of the statute of limitation, I guess. Mm -hmm. So in that case, my question is to which court such action should it should bring uh, the EU TM code still existing after the uh, break is? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, it depends whether the EU TM courts are still there. So if you, if you were to do that now, you could do that through UK courts acting as EU TM mm. courts. Um, afterwards, you'd have to go through UK courts. Mm. But my expectation would be that whatever EU TM was infringed, the, the, you'd be relying on the clone, you know, the cloned yeah. right of that EUTM in the UK, so it would be a UK 
the UK matter. And then if you wanted an injunction in the European Union, you'd have to go through uh, one of the courts on the continent mm -hmm. uh, or an island to get that. Okay, uh, next question. Very briefly, what are there any significant differences right now under the way UK applications would be prosecuted under UK law and how they're now prosecuted at the EU under the EU law? Well, the theoretical answer to that one is the laws of all of the member states are supposed to be harmonized. Okay, so that, that's the theory. Yeah. <laughs> the reality is slightly different. Um, and I think, you know, there are differences that I touched on, such as the requirement for intent to use. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the examination on prior rights is the same in terms of there will be prior rights, the, the earlier rights holders will be notified. Um, it didn't used to be like that in the UK, but it is now. Um, the opposition periods are substantively the same. I think the one area that we have encountered difficulty with um, at the European Trademark Office is when assessing the distinctive character of a trademark. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if any of yeah, you have had experience with that. There was a watershed but moment it is, where it changed. <laughs> where it just, yeah, over the last number of years, um, they have conducted what we think is a very forensic analysis of the mark and have issued very formulaic um, office actions. The real advantage of the UK system is that when that happens, you can request a hearing, so and that's an in-person conversation with a more senior examiner. In Europe, you have to present written arguments, and it goes to the same examiner who wrote the initial report. Um, it's really difficult to change their mind. Um, and that's, for me, that's the key difference in the systems, actually. Um, and that's why some clients actually will say, is it easier to get this through in a UK? If they've had experience of it, is it easier to get it through in a UK national level? Um, and I think yeah. you'd agree with that. I'd agree I mean, with that. Yeah, and I'd say, especially probably a tip that we could give in the context of Madrid Protocol applications, which have to be based on a home application or mm -hmm. registration, uh, our favorite uh, choice there would be the UK. Absolutely. Because it yeah. gets prosecuted much quicker, uh, and um, it's not uncommon to actually get it within the six-month priority period. Yeah. So you have the comfort of ha having a UK registration before you even file your Madrid, mm. so you don't have that risk of central attack. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and the opposition rates are lower just by pure geography. So yeah. you've only got the UK that will oppose, uh, oppose uh, fewer people, whereas the EUTM has got more countries that could come against you. So yeah. the UK is really a good choice as a base for Madrid. It is a good choice for that reason, you know, the speed and also I think the quality of the examination. Um, we're literally, for composite marks, we're getting office actions that give you the dictionary definition of each, each part of the mark and therefore the conclusion is it's non-distinctive. It's really frustrating. Um, and yeah, it can be a drawn out process and because the, fate are, the fates are tied for the first five years, you've got that element of uncertainty. Also, if you're filing in Madrid based elsewhere, so based on a home registration in another country, it doesn't cost that much more to designate Europe and the UK uh, under Madrid rather than just Europe. Yeah, so it's, it's an easy tick box. Yeah. It's a very small fee if you just want to go for the UK in, mm. in addition. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Joanne and, and Drew. Thank you.